So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming into my session. I just wanted to present here a strange idea I had uh, some time ago. It's a kind of automating uh, the diagnostic process, but in production, which is, I mean, something that you should really be care <laughs> not to mess up your entire production website. And uh, I am uh, Raffaele, uh, I'm a software architect. I all usually travel around the world uh, to, to go and give talks and conferences. I have been in many places, many nice places all around the world. And um, I am a consultant in many industries. Uh, usually I, uh, I really love to compare the different kind of problematics that uh, are in production, so different uh, between, uh, uh, I mean, uh, financial and the healthcare or uh, racing cars like Formula One and then manufacturing environment. So, so many different uh, things that have to be done in different ways, depending on the context. And I really love that. So uh, you can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, and uh, we will talk uh, a little bit of my last project that I wrote to you for uh, automating diagnostics. So let, let's go on and, and then we will see. Uh, first of all, my editor, uh, just uh, created me yesterday this uh, discount code for a book that I wrote with the other smart guys. And it's about uh, C Sharp 8 and .NET Core. Of course, there is already C Sharp 9, but you know, there are many things uh, every year. So <laughs> let's stick with this one. And then maybe we will update uh, the title in, in the future. And, uh, well, if you want, uh, this is the, the super code uh, that they produce it to have a, a nice discount. Let's go on and let's start about this presentation. What's the goal for today? So the goal is automating the diagnostic process in production. This is a very delicate uh, topic because, I mean, in production, you should not want to install anything that can disrupt the environment and so on, but we will see how to do. And uh, basically, this is a two-step process. So the first one is triggering a diagnostic, so understanding what's the best time, uh, moment in time where you want to start your diagnostic process. And uh, we will do this uh, using the diagnostic client library, which is pretty new in, in .NET. And then uh, we will programmatically analyze and diagnose the application using uh, CLRMD, which uh, is a historical library uh, similar to what SOS does, okay? So normally you, you, you make diagnostic at development time, of course. So in at that time frame, you, your, best your best friend at, at development time is the debugger, maybe Visual Studio, maybe uh, WinDBG if you are in Windows, or LLDB uh, with the SOS. SOS is a very, very important and fundamental uh, plugin for uh, those debuggers because uh, they, it's a plugin that can give you a clear idea on how the memory of a managed process is structured. So uh, it, uh, it's easier to investigate on a, on a .NET application because you know exactly how an object is made, what are the metadata, and you can walk the tree, you can go to the roots of the garbage collector and so on. So there are many specific details that otherwise, if you see just the memory from a native perspective, it's a mess. But unless you're analyzing a dump, uh, please don't use them in production. I mean, it's something that you don't want to. And also, if you want to use a dump, you know that dumping a process can take a while, and so you don't want to stop uh, the application in process just to 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 bring a snapshot and and say oh oh my god now I am uh, shutting almost down everyone just to take the the dump in production. There are of course other uh, tools and uh, profilers, of course are one of the best. I mean uh, there are two kind of pro profilers: the one that you can even use in production and uh, or the one that you can use at development time. You normally you want to profile to see the performance of the application and the memory profiling 
uh, on your development machine, of course, if you can reproduce the problem and the issue. But um, uh, I mean, there are two different uh, categories. The first one is the classical uh, performance that uh, profiler that you can uh, just uh, install your machine and monitor what's what's happening. And the other one is just to test a very small portion of your code to understand whether they can hit the performance and the overall performance. But at the very last moment, when you are in production and you get a problem, I mean, you kind of, uh, I mean, uh, are, uh, you, you make a, you, you probably are feel like uh, lost because there is something that you may still not understand. You may still uh, uh, was not in your goals, and so you you don't know exactly what to do. By the way, there are other things that you can do. I worked a lot in the .NET debugging infrastructure, which is a different topic. But uh, I mean, how to build a, a debugger and the language, a DSL, and so on, code generation. And if you're interested, please let me know because I'm very proficient in that uh, space. So, but what about troubleshooting in production? This is the problem. And uh, of course, you start with the log and uh, the logs are super important, but must be balanced and not too much, not too few. I mean, there are many uh, discussions about this and requires a lot of wisdom because uh, it depends from the uh, information that you want to log and not always the logs are so clear. And uh, I mean, how many times I face it to this uh, issue with the customers, it's a very tough problem. So uh, creating a dump is definitely a huge help because you have a, like a photo of your process in that moment. But uh, when do you want to catch uh, this photo? And uh, there are many tools to, to take a dump. You may know .NET dump is the a global tool that you may install uh, and very lightweight to, to capture the dump, but there are many other alternatives. You probably knows uh, all of them. And um, catching the perfect moment to, to take this photo is difficult. You have to make your process smile <laughs> before taking the photo. And uh, this is a big problem. So uh, the other, uh, possibility that you have is to install uh, the performance counters monitors in production like .NET Trace, .NET Counters, and so on. And uh, for example, .NET Monitor is very valuable because it exposes directly uh, a website, and then you can go with your browser and visit certain endpoints, and they will show you the memory status and uh, what's going on with the CPU and the memory pages and so on. So everything is very good, but still uh, you may, I mean, uh, miss the perfect moment. So uh, the challenges with dump analysis uh, are very high because picking the right moment is super challenging and certain events we know are sporadic and so something that uh, rarely happens uh, and you cannot stay hours in front of your machine to understand what's the best moment. So the other uh, point is that uh, once you have the dump and you may have been lucky in capturing the right moment, you know, there are problems that uh, managing, investigating uh, the memory with the SOS, it's boring. It's hard because the comments are not that easy. It's very repetitive because you may have hundreds of uh, allocations, uh, even thousands or <laughs> even more, and uh, repeating all uh, over and over all the comments to uh, catch the perfect moment, it's definitely very, very hard. And it's, of course, uh, an expensive uh, uh, process that, uh, I mean, not many companies want to, to afford. Also, when this investigation is made by the human, there are also uh, legal problems. So uh, there may be sensitive data, Let, let's take in the healthcare environment, there are many issues about that, and the privacy constraints. So you may have, a, you may require a, a, a to be delegated to uh, act on that particular content. Uh, you may want that uh, um, you don't have, of course, sensitive data. They may be the 
hash uh, of the sensitive data instead uh, uh, of the clear uh, uh, data in memory, but before or later you may catch the moment in which the, the, the data is clear, uh, visible, and so it's not that good. So uh, what's our scenario for today? And uh, let's see how does it work, this strange idea that I had. You have normally uh, an application that is in process on your right, that is an ASP.NET Core with uh, the CLR, of course, controllers, services, whatever else. And this is our process that you want to investigate. And normally we have a lot of clients that uh, hits this application and something may go wrong and we don't know exactly what. So in the scenario of today, we, I replaced, of course, uh, the, the clients, the browsers with uh, a stress application, which uh, you can see from this menu is a console application. And you have many possibilities. You can make gets uh, and post on web APIs with uh, even a, a concurrent number of requests. So here, the simple post, for example, is ex executed at the same exact time in the 1,000 requests so that you can create a certain load to stress the application. Maybe you have other ways to see uh, and to stress your application, which is good. There are many good tools to do that, but just, this is just for our demo, our proposals. And they can do several things. A simple get, a single post, uh, causing some exception on, on, the, on the server side, uh, causing um, something that goes very, very slow on the server side, and so you want to see what really happens. And then you can leak just blobs, so byte arrays, or entire graph in memory, and we will see that. And uh, also, if you want to repeat the test, you can free the leaks, and then uh, GC collect if you want to see the differences, and CPU stress, of course, slow down everything, which is not very practical when you have to, to stream uh, your demo uh, over the internet, but, but that's good. And also, there is a, one important thing. So we can also trigger uh, our diagnostic with the custom header. So one of these, we will see in a moment, can also uh, trigger uh, a diagnostic uh, in the, so that we add uh, an X dash something, and this will be recognized from the application, and we, we, we can trigger that diagnostic then. So, Okay, this is the sh scenario. Let's let's uh, make an hypothesis for a moment that uh, everything is is okay, is up and running, and and we run this. And uh, the idea is to run a second application. Let's call it uh, like a sidecar application that uh, lives on the same machine, of course, and just has the duty to monitor our process number one. And we want to subscribe the trace events, which are basically the same that every profile subscribes. So it's not invasive, it's something very lightweight. It's um, uh, something that you may want to use in order to have the perfect moment, or to know the perfect moment that you want to investigate uh, why the, the, the process is, is making something wrong. And so, our diagnostic application will run the diagnostic client, which is able to open this channel with directly the CLR. So you don't have to prepare anything else in your application, just the CLR that is from Netcore 3.0 is ready to be diagnosed in local, thanks to a local named pipe. And you can connect to this server and you can directly talk with the CLR of any application, if you have the permission, of course, and uh, investigate on what's going on. And when you subscribe to events, you receive just the same events you can see with uh, the various performance monitor and what else, okay? It's a very similar uh, mechanism to ETW, but it's on that .NET Core, so this inter mechanism of the trace events is something that run also cross-platform. And then we will diagnose uh, the issues using CLRMD 2.0, but also some extension that I wrote to this purpose. The first thing that I want to do is that when I see that the memory is too high, maybe I have 
uh, a very high number of HTTP requests uh, in a second and whatever else you can think about. So memory and threads and blah, 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 or uh, first time exceptions, for, for example, you can like take a snapshot not a dump because the dump is heavier and but you can take a, a snapshot which it takes uh, which takes um, about uh, 100 milliseconds uh, maybe 200 milliseconds at, at maximum it's not super lightweight but uh, in sometimes it can take uh, even lower than the 100 milli, uh, milliseconds so you don't want to make this continuously and this is why we have to monitor these trace events and take just the snapshot at the, at the right moment, in the moment that you really believe that there is something that is going very strange. And when you take the snapshot, we can literally forget about the application because we will do every investigation, not on the process, but just on the snapshot. And so the CLRMD is able to snapshot the application and this is a snapshot application is investigated, uh, just forgetting uh, all uh, whatever else. Meanwhile, you can continue to monitor the application. So if you want to take a second snapshot and third snapshot, you can. So it's something that you, literally you absolutely can do. So at the very end, uh, the idea is not to have a, a new uh, cool tool generic for all your applications that can diagnose everything. The idea that I want to uh, give you is that you should create your own diagnostic application. But of course, this is a demo, this is a session. And so I created a generic application, a kind of generic debugging, post-mortem debugging that can investigate in the snapshot just to show you what kind of features do you have at your fingertips so you want to investigate so i create a just for this demo but I mean, again it's something that it's it's not the point in production a diagnostic process which is a wpf application uh, where you can just take a snapshot and investigate it and every uh, items every item you see in the in this combo box is a query on the memory or in the thread on the modules that is inside the dump so this is extra important in a real scenario of course you don't want a ui you want to automate the process the idea is that you can leverage the same library i use it to create this tool in order to uh, diagnose your application so let's see now uh, the point and uh, i want to very very to be very very clear you have almost the same power of this sos but you don't have to type anything okay and the, all the sources are inside the this repository so that you can uh, poke it and open an issue if you want collaborate um, send me a pull request and let's talk about it is uh, up uh, the, the conversation so let's go straight to visual studio and uh, and see uh, what we have here the first thing that i want to to show you is that uh, i have this terminal window so it, this is the windows terminal with uh, a, a couple of sub window which is very nice to be able to split it and uh, i want to run .net run this is our test application so it's a website the asp.net core application here is the process id and uh, on this part we have the stress application okay and so i can make a, a, a high number of requests of course the first time is lower because you have to uh, jit the, the code and you see, I can uh, make a simple post and you see that there is some uh, response on the other side and okay, pretty normal, nothing cool to see. I mean, it's, uh, it's okay. And then we can open our uh, WPF application, our diagnostic application, and uh, I can uh, monitor a process you see here is 
the whole list, I take the test web application, I press OK, and I start seeing here all the trace events that happen inside our ASP.NET core application. And every time I take my controller and I hit something, you see that there is a reaction. So the number of HTTP requests at four per second is going on and the CPU uh, begin growing and uh, the, the memory is, is going up and down and so on. And we can, for example, uh, make a, a leak graph so that you see, I have 1000 requests of something that will leak some memory. We'll go in a static dictionary, which is of course a, a common way to make leaks inside uh, a managed application. And uh, maybe you also have exceptions. And uh, of course, the second, uh, the second chance exceptions does not make sense because it, it will cause, uh, would cause uh, the, the crash of the, of the application. But of course, the first uh, uh, chance exception are very important to monitor because they can really slow down a lot of your entire application. And so this is a good, good opportunity to see what happens and maybe if you discover that you have more than uh, 100 uh, uh, exceptions per second, you may want to, to, to investigate in what is the code that is causing this and, and, and so on. So now that we have some leak in memory, I want to take a snapshot. So uh, if you go to the status bar here, you see I, it took 185 milliseconds also because the code was not just jitted. And so if I repeat, you see that in reality, the snapshot is taking a very short amount of time. And so uh, from now on, we can run query just on, uh, the, on the memory and the snapshot that I created. And so the, the one of the, if you are familiar with the SOS, you know that there is a command to call it a dump hipstat. And this is a, the exact replication of that. And so we collect the statistics, seeing the me method table and uh, the type, and we, you may have many of these objects and they are ordered by graph size. This is something that I added because it's not uh, very uh, clear uh, in, in SOS, but it's the, whole, the overall size of all the objects. And so if you go to the very last, since they are ordered this way, you can see that I have a, a, a lot of byte arrays. And uh, I mean, this number is suspect. And so we can see the details here. You see the first chance exception are coming just because uh, we have a number of uh, interrupted communication with the HTTP client that is causing the IO operation has been aborted. This is, is part of, uh, it, this is what happens on the uh, server side when uh, a client uh, interrupted the, the communication and did not close uh, the HTTP communication. Okay, but I can clear the, uh, the message here with, uh, with this button. And, and you see that there, there are a lot of byte arrays. So this is the overall size and this is each individual size. And if I go down, 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 you can see there are many of them and uh, I can uh, do a lot of things. Uh, it, the, the, the amount of memory is really huge. We have, uh, for example, this uh, uh, allocation and uh, when we uh, click something that uh, is not uh, too big, uh, the tool automatically um, show what, what's the, the, the condition. And uh, we have this, uh, uh, this pane below that will give you uh, a very important report on what's happening. Basically, this is the allocation. It's a byte array whose address is uh, blah, blah, blah. The method table is the one we have seen in this uh, column before, and the size is, of course, the same. But now uh, we want to find who is taking a reference to it. So why this byte array is in memory? And uh, the root for this object 
is the system object here is a pin handle. And when you have an array, which is a pin handle, this is not normally something that uh, is inside a static. And uh, we may have different path, of course, because there are many possible uh, path that uh, can uh, of an object that can be referenced from multiple uh, parts. We have an object array and then a graph root. So this list of objects is something that is holding it. And uh, in my report also, I try to understand what, what which is the name of the field in the object that is, that is holding uh, this reference, and uh, you can uh, uh, decode it. And uh, it, it is telling me that uh, is hold on memory precious service uh, underscore roots is the name of the field. So let's go to Visual Studio and uh, go to the memory precious service. And you can see here roots and this is static. And this is why this byte arrays is holding memory. So it's not that bad. I mean, it's really amazing to see that you can investigate start, starting from a dump uh, exactly what is causing your memory leak or you can i mean pick whatever else uh, in, in in your uh, in your dump and investigate exactly what's going on and you see for example this string is does not have any reference maybe it's going to be garbage collected and then uh, others of course, there are similar investigation. The tool is now a pretty slower than normal, of course, because there are uh, the, the communication, the sharing screen in the, that is uh, going on uh, with uh, with our conference. But uh, of course, there are many other. Uh, I mean, it, it can be also very, very uh, slow. So that I had to add a account in order that, for example, if you click here and it's uh, too expensive, the operation you you are warned, you can click uh, yes and go on. It will take time. Um, uh, it it will take time, but uh, I, I mean it's up to you if you want to to wait uh, or not. You want to uh, to show the error. Uh, Oh, sorry, I don't get um, the, the the question from uh, the chat is, can you show the code again, the uh, like in error root? Okay, yes, of course. And this is uh, exactly uh, the, the problem. So we have something that is static. It's a list and I accumulate with an add some roots and these roots are objects that I created in very, it's very straightforward with a, with a graph that also have childs and then you have grandchilds and there are a lot of memory that you may want to investigate. But the point is that this is a root because it's static and it will never go away until you uh, put roots equal null. And uh, since I, I um, made it on purpose, of course, uh, you can easily understand how to visualize this kind of errors. So uh, what's the entire point uh, of uh, this application? Uh, and then away, I will go back to the demo because I have other important things to show you uh, before going on. The, the point is that uh, on the WPF application, I uh, did not use on purpose MVVM uh, pattern because I want that uh, uh, the code is, can be understood completely from anyone, even those that are not familiar with WPF. So it's it extremely straightforward, uh, straightforward. So for example, the query in the combo are dump hipstat, for example, is uh, just this query on uh, the on the memory and and you can easily understand what's going on and this get static field with graph and size and so on so you have all the queries and in many cases uh, i can uh, i use something that is not inside uh, uh, the diagnostic application but this uh, other project it's a library called clr diagnostics which uh, 
has this uh, huge diagnostic analyzer and uh, has a lot of prepared uh, queries and, and things to do. So capturing from dump, from snapshot, uh, from process, and you can load uh, a dump from the file. Uh, then you can analyze the statics uh, and you see a lot of queries. So you can dig, uh, go deep dive and analyze what, what's going on there. And for example, our SOS uh, can can do a lot of things. If you want to see how the reports was created, for example, this is the uh, method that count the number of references that are there. If there are too many, I give you the message box. And this is the guy who prepares uh, all the reports that you have in the lower pane of the application. And find referencing is, is the one that search in the graph for every possible reference. Uh, should you have the uh, to do it manually, finding references is a, is a nightmare because you have to poke in uh, the memory for all the possible addresses, which is impossible doing it uh, manually. And so uh, it's absolutely uh, astonishing to see how powerful is CLRM Deep in giving you this opportunity. And so th this is uh, very clearly uh, important to do automatically. And uh, I still want to, to show you in the demo uh, other a few other queries. And uh, the getting st static fields with graph and the size give you uh, all the static fields that you may have. These are, can be the source of leaks, uh, for example, and uh, uh, starts from the biggest one. For example, one of the biggest one is this, this back in field because I use for, uh, for the demo some timer queues. And, uh, and then you have the other uh, conceal callback rules. And you see here my field roots, because this is the entire size of uh, the things that I leaked and uh, is here. So uh, it's a different way to see uh, if there are leaks. And uh, this, uh, this comes from the code that I run uh, and from the infrastructure, you may find a, a lot of things coming from Kestrel and, and so on. But this is basically a good query to understand if you have leaks. And then duplicate strings. This is the source of many problems in, in real world application. And you see that there are many duplicate strings. It doesn't make sense of having duplicate strings has, uh, you know, uh, the strings are, are, are uh, value types, so they are copied every time you, uh, uh, I'm, uh, sorry, they, they, they are treated as value types. They are reference type, but they are treated like value types because they are read-only, they are immutable. And, and so uh, if you happen to copy the string because of various operations that you can do on it, uh, maybe a trim without success or maybe other things like that, uh, you obtain uh, copies, not references, and this can, I mean, push the 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 the, the total uh, overall performance and give you uh, problems. Uh, of course, these kind of numbers are pretty normal, so you don't, don't have to care too much. But I saw in production a lot of pro problems like that, and you maybe want to see the strings by size. So the longest strings, the strings come from here, which is probably the environment. There are 30K of paths used to all the stuff that I installed. Then I have the modules, which are important to see what is exactly the DLL that was loaded in the process. And also the thread stacks. So this is something that is not working really very well. And you, you may see also uh, the frame name if they are not uh, native. In this case, you see there are uh, empty, uh, empty frames just because uh, these are uh, uh, things that are, come from the infrastructure, but there are documented issues on CLRMD at the moment on this. And this is the complete list of the routes uh, in the same way that um, uh, they are proposed by, uh, by the SOS, and you have a lot of object here, of course. And uh, object by size is another good query because you can uh, see what is the object uh, that is, uh, uh, of course, I mean, not the method table, so not the entire category, and as you saw in the 
a dump heap stat. This is the biggest object of all that you have in, in your memory. And you can see here what is the route that is keeping this object on. And this is in, in the infrastructure and you, you have much other. You see here, this object, the second one has, uh, oh my God, an a very huge number of references. I don't want to continue because it, it's going to take too much for the demo. But of course, if you really need it, you, you can you can proceed and, uh, and and do it. And then uh, non-system object by size. This is just a filter over the uh, the, the system names uh, namespaces. So you just see your own objects, and you want to see just your own uh, models and services and uh, whatever else. And uh, by the way, I can also. Uh, return uh, at the very beginning, like dump if start, and then uh, put something here, and you see that test web app, I am filtering by test web app, or even here. And, and so you, it's very it's very practical to, to have a quick filter on, on it. And then there is this last, get object grouped by allocator, and you are not going to see anything here but just because there is just the default allocator but if i load a dump file uh, that i created using two different uh, assembly load contexts which is uh, 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 the new way of unloading assemblies in dotnet core uh, you can see that i loaded the, the dump and uh, now i can go here and you see there are two different uh, add-ons, two different um, assembly load contexts. This is very important because sometimes since uh, the assembly load contexts are collaborative, so they need all the references to the objects laying inside the assembly load context gets uh, uh, freed. Uh, there is no more references because it's, it's the garbage collector that throws away this. When you want to unload, the assembly load context. If there is any object that is still referenced, you uh, will not uh, uh, obtain the unload. So since it's collaborative, and so I can investigate what are the object objects that are inside it, uh, and if I then follow the routes, I can understand who is keeping the route, and then again I will uh, find that I have a sort of leak that is preventing me to investigate uh, and unload uh, the assembly load context. That's uh, a lot of information. Let's go back for a while on here, and uh, I will show the, the custom header here. And if you repeat the two, for example, you will see that um, uh, I have this custom uh, header that is uh, triggering a higher number. And this is basically the idea that if you want from the external, maybe with your web application, authenticate on the test web app and say, oh, it, it's responding like crappy. I don't, I want to understand. I wish I could make a, a snapshot now. I want to trigger uh, my own uh, uh diagnostic investigation now because i am seeing that the application is not working correctly you can use a, a custom header just to trigger the um the, the diagnostic process and the, you, you of course uh, are going to investigate it and make it making the snapshot only if uh, the application is really uh i mean in a, in a condition that is not uh good and uh, if you are authenticated, of course. So uh, let's go back for a moment on the slides and uh, beyond all the code that you can see on, uh, on GitHub, of course, that is very, very interesting. You may, uh, I want to give you a glimpse. So uh, the diagnostic client is very simple to use. Just take the process ID and uh, you uh, create this event pipe provider and uh, just uh, telling which are the main provider that are well known. So, so you don't have to invent anything or write anything special. I want to subscribe the system runtime uh, and uh, having all the informational events, no special keywords because they can give you some filters. And um, I want to be notified uh, once uh, uh, in a second 
and then uh, I open the session client, okay, with the list of providers, and then uh, also uh, you can put more than one, of course. This is just one, these are many, because you can have multiple providers. And then you uh, create this event pipe, event source, which receive the event streams uh, from the named pipes that uh, are, is open at the, uh, when the CLR server that is uh, pushing events. And you can subscribe either dynamically everything, or there are also typed events, and, and so you, you can process them. Just be warned that the source.process is a synchronous call, so you may have to uh, task run or put in a separate thread in order to uh, not to block uh, the rest of the application. That's it. I mean, it's super simple, and these are our triggers. You, you know, this way is the way that you can receive the triggers. And uh, what can uh, what triggers you have? Memory, CPUs, uh, first chance exceptions, HTTP requests, or whatever else. And of course, custom events uh, uh, counters. And just to show you the example of the custom event counters, uh, extremely simple. You just derive uh, the event source with your own name. You put uh, this uh, attribute here. Okay, and then the, there are a very small boilerplate that you have to uh, to use in order to to push it, and then inside the test web application. So my um, web application, I created a middleware. Okay, this middleware, which is of course declared in the startup application. Okay, so in the startup, you may see. Uh, where, where they put here, uh, request hook. Okay, so F12 and then use middleware request hook and then F12 and here we are. And every time I get an invoke, you can use HTTP context to decide what are the condition to trigger this counter. And every time you trigger this, you will see the number that I showed before on the WPF application that is increasing. And, and that's it. So I decided to use with the custom header. You can decide to uh, trigger in a different way. I mean, it's up to you. It's just, this is just an example. And um, I mean, we have all the ingredients to make it work, but uh, there is something more. Uh, the uh, diagnostic client is improving, and uh, with .NET 5 in the CLR, uh, there is also a reverse channel communication. So, basically, uh, instead of being the uh, your debugger, let's say that communicate with uh, the CLR of the diagnosed application, with the, which is acting as a server, the process here is totally inversed. And so, basically, you start your own diagnostic server and listen to an EPC port. At this point, you specify this port with the diagnostic ports environment variable from which you start the application. And this practically tells the CLR, so you don't have to do anything with your code, it's just the CLR that understands this in .NET 5, that uh, there is something happening there and uh, it sh should start talking in the, this IPC ch channel before the application uh, bootstrap. And now the application connects with your local server that you open it here and goes in a wait state. So it's kind of suspended, but only if they find a good communication. At this point, you subscribe any event you are interested in. Okay. And then you resume the application uh, using this uh, special communication protocol. And finally, uh, the, event, the events that you subscribe that start flowing and you receive everything normally. And why do you, can you, uh, do you want to use this method? And it's terribly useful because this is the way you can uh, replicate the famous uh, tool, the Fusion Log Viewer. And so if you have bootstrapping uh, issues, if you want um, to monitor which are the assemblies that are loaded uh, from within uh, 
your application and which other can't be uh, loaded because the, the, the resolution of the, 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 the probes uh, directory failed, you uh, want to really capture the initial bootstrapping uh, life of your application. And uh, I have a separate tool for this, uh, which in, in the same repository, which is called, called uh, I mean, let me collapse uh, all the others so that you can see exactly. So uh, practically, this is the fusion, fusion debugging, which is the, the, let's say our application. And it, it is run directly from this, which is the tool. And uh, I had to fork the .NET Core client because they still don't have the final, the version that can be used broadly in public. So there are uh, internal methods instead of public. And so I want really to test and show you here how, what, what's going on. And uh, in this tool, I basically replicate the exact points uh, I told you in uh, inside the slide. So I want to explain again here. And if I just run this guy, uh, he will run the application, of course. And you can see that subscribing to uh, those events, I can really see exactly what are the path of uh, uh, the DLLs that since the very first moment of the bootstrap process of the application are loaded in memory. So this is an, an exceptional, uh, way to, to make tools that can diagnose the, 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 the startup, the, the bootstrap of your application. And uh, so uh, this uh, is basically uh, what you would expect uh, from uh, uh, the old Fusion Lab Viewer, which, which was a very well known uh, tool in .NET Framework and uh, uh, show uh, the assembly being loaded from uh, .NET process. The hard work of our diagnosing process is made from CLRMD, which is in version two. It supports .NET framework as well as .NET Core, and it is improving a lot over uh, the months because uh, they, I, I, by the way, also gave my, um, a contribution with the PR to uh, make uh, something better. And specifically the assembly load context requested the cha a change in, um, in the DAC, which is a special native module C++ that exposed the information that can be investigated in, in .NET world that uh, allowed to uh, retrieve the name of the assembly load context that uh, is uh, uh, that are in memory. And by the way, the assembly load context uh, had uh, major improvements in the very latest uh, in uh, 5.0. Uh, I discovered just, just uh, running my own uh, test on the on the on the tool, and uh, things are getting better and better. So it's a very very good uh, way to work with. And um, by the way. Um, the information that you can diagnose with CLRMD are just managed. So if you have interoperability issues or want to investigate on C++ object, that's totally different uh, uh, job. You would have to use other structures. They are, of course, uh, easier to investigate because uh, native uh, is just uh, the way you design it. So it's a C++ object that is easier to investigate, but you don't have metadata. So you, of course, have to provide the correct PDBs in order to, to get another information, not to get crazy and do uh, all the bad reverse engineering by yourself. Also, uh, the information that can be retrieved are very, very, very wide. I mean, there are a lot of, you can read some of them here. Uh, there is also support for the COM stuff that, that I didn't put inside my tool because I focused specifically on .NET Core and on uh, Windows 10 64 bits because <clears throat> this is just something that for a demo, I believe it's uh, more than enough to, to give the idea of how it works. And uh, there are mu many new things that are, are coming I mean, uh, the CLRMD is improving uh, version after version, 
there is a separate uh, utility because uh, the authors, the team that is currently uh, writing the CLRMD doesn't want uh, to put too much uh, uh, helper functions inside the main library because there are many possible use cases and they don't want uh, to make it grow too much. So there is a Microsoft Diagnostic Runtime Utilities where there are others that can be use useful, but you don't, they wanted to keep it separate. And basically my library is very similar to this one. In fact, I had contributed also to this project with uh, some of the queries that uh, uh, that I wrote inside the CLR diagnostic, and they plan to add more. If they want, I can put them all, of course, but I don't know if uh, uh, how much is the trade off of the uh, amount of code I can put in, in there. And so, anyway, this is public. You can go there and uh, give me feedback. At the moment, I didn't care too much about the, um, I mean, uh, how heavy is a query? How long can it take? I didn't uh, propagate uh, all the cancellation tokens and so on, because this is a demo. So you have to uh, make a balance by yourself in deciding, okay, it's going to take too much. If it's, a, uh, if, if, if it's too heavy, maybe I want to um, suspend or interrupt and block uh, or conceal uh, the query because it's too heavy. And you have several examples uh, there, by the way, because uh, uh, in, in the code, uh, if we come back so on the CLR diagnostic, you have, you see a lot of queries. These group buys are going to take a while, also the order by descending and to dictionary and so on. So uh, here you have to balance exactly what you are going to do, how large is your memory space. Maybe uh, your working set is very large and you want to balance uh, the usage. The good thing is that your diagnostic application, which is the one running this kind of queries, is a separate process. So anything that should go wrong for some reason will not impact the production uh, application. It will just uh, eventually crash, but alone without uh, having uh, too much disturbance to, 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 the, to the broad public. And, and this is, I find, a, a very nice thing. Uh, someone asked me if I can run uh, this tool on, uh, or this library in a sidecar application. And uh, the result, the, the point is that <clears throat> the IPC communication <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> the IPC communication that uh, talks uh, between uh, uh, the, this library and uh, the CLR is uh, IPC with named pipes uh, and uh, is limited uh, on local host for security reasons. So <clears throat> either you have a kind of um, uh, agent and then you can run the diagnostic application in a sidecar uh, a container. Otherwise, of course, this is not possible. But uh, eventually running both the process inside the same container is not that bad. I mean, there are separate processes. You may give some constraints in terms of memory and uh, uh, avoid the, they give you problems of any other types there. And um, <clears throat> With regards uh, on the, the other things, there are some things on the allocator side that uh, I made some experiment. You may find some code that uh, it's not really uh, used anymore because this was before uh, the changes that occurred in uh, with the latest iteration, thanks to the DAC, the DAC, that has been changed with .NET 5. But I mean, the code is there. Uh, please take a look at it if you are interested in this kind of topic and uh, give me uh, some feedback. I would appreciate that uh, a lot. So let's go <clears throat> back to and, and go uh, to the conclusion. Uh, this is uh, exactly the, the main idea of automating the stuff. And if you have question, I will answer to all of you either here for the five minutes that uh, are still left 
or eventually after uh, the session on uh, track one on Slack. And uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, your time and participating to this uh, session. I am eager to uh, visit your conference as soon as possible in person. I am talking to a camera is not the best thing <laughs> that I can do, but certainly in person uh, we can have, have uh, uh, great conversations and great discussions, and uh, I love that uh, so much. Thank you very much.